do. And um, with great pleasure, uh, we can uh, host uh, Ms. Marta Novak, who's an academic teacher at the University of Warsaw and Open University at the University of Warsaw, where she conducts, among others, academic writing classes. She also works at Durham University, Great Britain, where she teaches, teaches English for academic purposes. Uh, she specializes in teaching, writing, and academic skills. Marta is also a trainer, coach, and examiner at, of Cambridge and IELTS. And today she's um, uh, here on behalf of uh, National Geographic, Geographic Learning uh, Poland. And uh, Marta, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Martin. Thank you. Um, can you all heal me, hear me well? Can you see me? Great. Um, can you see the presentation? It should be saying National Geographic Learning. Excellent. Right. Um, so I've already seen where you are from. We've got actually it's a great international audience. We've got um, India, Argentina, Egypt, um, Bosnia, the Czech Republic, and of course, many different cities in Poland. I'm very, very pleased to be talking to such an international audience. Um, so tonight I'll be talking to you about developing critical thinking skills and study skills in an open way. Um, I have been told that the title of my presentation may be somewhat confusing. So let me begin with explaining the acronym and the background to this title. So, you know, EAP traditionally, let's say, or in the world of teaching English, stands for English for Academic Purposes. And very often it is associated with um, those intensive courses um, that take place in the summer. Those courses are usually for international students who are going to do their masters or their undergraduate studies at universities in English, um, in English speaking countries. So these courses are called pre-sessional courses, um, and that's the type of teaching I also do in the UK. Um, I've been working at uh, Durham University for, a, well, a, a few years now. Um, and, uh, you know, this is what EAP is most often associated with. But um, I have been back to Poland, um, back in Poland, actually, um, for more than two years now. And I've been trying to show that EAP is much more than just pre-sessional courses. So I've been playing around with the acronym and I've been playing around, you know, with the name um, a little bit. And in my previous webinars for NGL and for IATEFL, I talked about the differences between teaching general English and English for academic purposes. Um, and, you know, and so that's the, let's say, that's the first EAP then I would like to show you that EAP is, you know, it is much more than English um, and actually it is much more than academic purposes um, because, you know, the, the skills that we teach um, in the academic context, they can, they are easily transferable outside the classroom. Today's EAP, so explicitly acquiring practical skills, um, it's, you know, that, that focuses on developing critical thinking skills and, um, and study skills, which are essential in creating more independent learners. So I'd like to show you that EAP, um, you know, this is the English for academic purposes, and that gives us the context really for, uh, for today's webinar. But this is much, much more than that. And I believe that, you know, not only pre-sessional students um, can get this type of training, but also second language students or foreign language students. Uh, when we talk about Poland, so students who study in Polish at universities, but who attend English classes. So the idea is that English for academic purposes can be available to a much wider range of students. 
and um, and I believe that it's more suitable for the academic context. So that's the that's the EAP um, I'm going to talk to you about tonight. Right, um, my. My talk tonight is divided into three main parts. So first we'll focus on the what, trying to define um, who independent critical thinkers are. Um, secondly, we'll look at the reasons why naming is not shaming, why using names, why labeling um, critical thinking skills and study skills, um, why, why it's so important in the process of learning. And in the third part, I'll show you, um, I'll talk about questions, using questions in developing critical thinking skills and study skills, um, using the right questions. I will be using examples from Pathways, which is a five-level course um, in English for academic purposes from National Geographic Learning. So let's begin. In the abstract, in the invitation for this webinar, there was an unfinished statement. If you read the invitation, you might remember it, but if you haven't, don't worry, I'll remind you um, in the next slide. I would like you to think about, you know, when you think about hmm, independent critical thinkers, think about your students. Um, what makes an independent critical thinker? What would you, you know, what would make you say, ah, this student has amazing critical thinking skills? I'd like you to, you know, to, to think about, you know, what independence in the learning process means and what, how would you define critical thinking? What kind of things a critical thinker, um, an independent, student who thinks critically what kind of things they do what kind of things they say um, do they have any habits that make them independent please share your answers in the chat i can see that some people are writing so we've got self-study asking questions mm -hmm. finding us on their own exactly thinking outside the box mm -hmm. being reasonable yes <laughs> bit vague but yes uh -huh. questions opinions exactly mm -hmm. expressing own opinions yep giving their arguments mm -hmm. analytical thinking use of strategies absolutely mm -hmm. thinking differently ah like apple products oh yeah that was um that's very good evidence of um amazing critical thinking skills uh -huh. being reflective Considering, thank you, Peter. Yeah, considering alternative views and opinions, absolutely taking into consideration what others have to say, um, mm -hmm. being curious, being well read. Great, great, thank you very much. Um, lots of very, very interesting answers. Um, all of them fine, you know, this is not one of these questions where you know, there's correct or incorrect answer. Um, well, of course, there's no one single definition of, um, you know, of an independent student who thinks critically. And everything you said, um, I'm not going to edit the slides now, but I would definitely put it on the slides. Um, so I'm going to show you, um, I'm going to show you um, some features of an independent student who thinks critically that I collected um, when I was doing my research in preparation for this webinar. Um, I read some studies. Um, well, I actually read materials by Alwyn Alexander from Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh. Um, she's a great authority in the world of EAP. And um, I found some inspiration that helped me um, structure the ideas, organize the ideas about independence in learning and about critical thinking. So an independent student, let's start from independence, they work smart 
and they learn effectively on their own. And my second question to you right now is, what does working smart mean to you in 2020 when everything is done online? What is working smart? What does it mean to you? When everything has been moved online, what is working smart? You can see some people are writing. Huh? Yeah, knowing where to look, mm -hmm. finding easy solutions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, work smart, not hard, right? Mm -hmm. Using time and resources wisely, definitely. Yeah, use of time effectively. Mm -hmm. Yes, being able to um, fight with procrastination. Uh, being curious, best possible solutions. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, so working smart also does have, um, you know, there are different ways in which we could interpret working smart. Um, I definitely agree with, with what you're saying. Yeah, getting good practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having good, you know, doing good practices, having good habits as well. Knowing weaknesses and strengths. Oh, I like that. Great. All right, thank you, thank you very much for great answers. We will talk, actually, I will talk a little bit more about features of independent learners in a minute. Um, but now I'd like to move on to talking about critical thinking. Um, you know, as teachers, we are often asked, um, we are told, you know, um, critical thinking is important teach more critical thinking but i think that sometimes there is some kind of mystery about what exactly critical thinking is so um so if you you know if you if you think about it um the three main points that i would like to explore today are first of all it is being able to take a stance. It is being able to have a clear position that is supported um, by evidence from sources. I will be using a little bit of this um, academic writing talk. Um, if something, you know, if you want me to clarify anything, just please let me know in the chat. So, yeah, having a clear position. Um, speaking of academic writing, this is one of the or the most important thing in any academic essay, a clear position, a clear opinion. Um, I'll talk about the word opinion in a minute. Let's stick to position, answer, stance, all of these, right? So that's one thing. Um, an essay without a clear position is not a good essay, simply. The second thing to consider is the ability to evaluate according to clear criteria. The ability to, to assess whether, for example, something is good or bad. Um, and that assessment is done based on certain criteria. And the third, um, the third feature of students who think critically is that they, they are able to link, they are able to connect, to make new connections between what they have already learned with something new in a new context and in a new situation. So they are able to apply their knowledge. Now, um, where does this well, let's say a definition, maybe description of um, a student who thinks critically come from. So in Alexander's study, she talked about asking university lecturers um, about their students' critical thinking skills. And the most interesting thing was that lecturers often noticed the lack of critical thinking skills, but it was more difficult for them to define what exactly they wanted their students to do. So the three main criticism about um, the lack of critical thinking skills um, were related to, to opinions. So the first one was 
students don't think for themselves. They don't give their opinions. Actually, I can relate to that. Um, when I think about teaching how to write essays, um, and now I'm talking about more general English classes rather than working with postgraduate students who are preparing to, to write the research papers. But um, students at, let's say, B2 level, um, and the essay question is, should university education be free for everybody? So when I mark those essays, what I often see is, um, well, some people say that, on the other hand, other people say that, so to sum up, people say different things. And then when I give feedback to that student and I ask them, um, yeah, but what do you think? What is your opinion? Uh, I, I, I don't know. <laughs> um, some students, actually, they are surprised that they are asked to give their opinion um, in, in writing. So this is, you know, this is actually quite quite common um something that i also see um oh yeah someone said me too yeah uni prep students usually have difficulty in finding ideas or giving their opinion to write about exactly well yeah we one of the one of the reasons for that is that yeah that there's no not enough discussion not enough debate not enough input for them to formulate their opinions based on something. Um, I'll show you how you can fix it with students today. Right, so one thing is opinions. Mind you, when we're talking about opinions um, in the academic context, I just want to clarify one thing. Um, in, especially in academic writing with EAP students, um, we teach them not to use phrases such as, in my opinion, or I think, and this may be slightly confusing for students because when they are told that um, when they are told that they shouldn't use I think or in my opinion, then they might be confused about oh, yeah. So wh where exactly do I give my opinion? Um, so this is only about the use of language. This can be, you know, an opinion, a position, actually, coming back to the previous slide. Um, so the position can be expressed um, in, you know, in words, in phrases, such as this essay will argue that. So that's what you can teach instead of I think. Right. Um, so working on opinions, thing number one. Another criticism that university lecturers often have is that um, students, they never question what they read, that they're not critical enough. Now, if you give feedback to a student on an essay and say, you are not critical enough, will they know what you're talking about? Probably, probably not. So that's another area to explore, the, the questioning, the, you know, the constant asking, so what's wrong with it? What's wrong with this argument? Can I accept it? Yeah, is it logical? Um, has the author missed out any information? By the way, these are the three critical questions we teach um, at Durham University um, when we talk about argumentation evaluating arguments. Um, I'll repeat them. So can I accept the premises? Um, do the premises lead logically to the conclusion of an argument? And has the author neglected or missed out any important information? These three questions um, are not only useful at Durham processional courses, they're useful in everyday lives when you watch TV and you know when you read papers. So making sure that students ask, or if, well, it's not asking, but making sure that they question the world around them, that's important and that's critical thinking. 
And the third um, criticism um, is that students, that students just regurgitate. That's a lovely word, by the way. They regurgitate. So they, they simply repeat facts or ideas without thinking about them first. Um, and that's very true as well. The fact that you used a source, um, it's not the end of the story. You're formulating your position based on a source, but do something with it. Evaluate it. Think about the source itself. So these are the three important features, um, three elements in developing critical thinking skills. Now, let's, um, let's turn to a few more details about learner autonomy. I am using learner autonomy and um, learner independence interchangeably. Someone might want to correct me. But for the purposes of this um, webinar, I'll stick to that. So one of the most important features of independent learners is that they are happy to, to try out new things, new approaches. When you think about 2020, and um, I mean teaching online to be more precise, <laughs> and how we all simply had to adapt and move to the online world. I've noticed that students who are reluctant to, to accept the situation, um, those who are not really happy to try out different types of software, um, those who complain about, oh, but I, I used Zoom and now I need to use Teams and it's different and I don't want to. Anyway, it's, actually, it's not just students. Um, it's, sometimes it's teachers as well. Those who are encouraged to keep an open mind and try out new things, um, these benefit the most. Um, creating such atmosphere of you know, of, of mutual learning, mutual respect for this is new. Okay, let's take time and learn it. You know, this is something, this atmosphere of trust as well, this is something that helps learners become more independent. Um, this is actually related, this, this atmosphere of trust it's actually related to the second point, which you can see on the screen. So making guesses um, and answering questions without thinking whether the answer is correct or not. So, well, these may not be language related questions, but different types of questions. Yeah, Sibel is saying if they want to be independent. Um, yeah, well, I think um, actually it's it's, we play, as teachers, we play a very big role in encouraging our students to be independent. It's a process. It doesn't happen instantly. But I think we play a big role in, in the process. Now, um, what else? What else um, are related to independent learners? Um, one thing that I want to emphasize here is Engaging in the learning process consciously, um, becoming more aware of not only what I need to learn, but also about how I'm going to do it and what it's going to take for me to, to learn it. So another feature is, um, is raising awareness of the learning process itself. Um, right. So we've got some features of independent um, independent students, and um, and so far we know we want independent students who are able to express clear positions, supported um, supported by evidence, um, students who want to question the world around them, and students who just don't who don't just repeat um, what they've read or heard. Now let's talk about why making the whole process um, with naming those skills which are involved in, um, in critical thinking skills and in study skills, why, um, why it should be explicit. 
why it should be open? Well, simply, I believe that students should know what they're doing when they're developing critical thinking skills. In you know different course books, different materials um, for language instruction, for learning English, um, it's they have very clearly labeled language skills. So it's obvious to students that oh right now I'm combining um, a listening task with um, with some grammar, you know, in the listening task, oh, I am practicing listening for detail, or I am focusing on, oh, this will help me to develop my understanding of the main ideas. And the same thing should be done with critical thinking skills. Critical thinking is, is a skill, yes, it's massive, it's, it's huge, you know, listening, Again, we talk about different, many different sub skills, and it's the same story with critical thinking. Um, so, so let's talk about thinking. The word critical is um, somewhat distracting and slightly ambiguous in the name critical thinking. So if we move away, from the word critical, and we focus on this much more useful word, which is thinking, we will discover that you know, it reveals a whole range of different thinking activities. And I think that it's OK to just think. By the way, if you have comments about me splitting the infinitive, um, I'll be happy to discuss that after the presentation. Um, I have a, you know, I have a feeling that thinking as a separate activity is taken for granted in the world where we are told to give answers immediately. Um, where you know we need to process lots of information very fast very quickly there's no time to think and thinking is good it's okay to stop for a moment and think about how you're going to react what you're going to say to think about what you just heard to think about what you just read so um, when I when I begin academic writing courses, the first class is always um, devoted to the process of writing. This is the time when I talk with my students about different stages of the process, what they involve. Um, and whenever I ask about those different stages, they say, yeah, well, so it's planning, it's, it's brainstorming, um, drafting, editing, proofreading, checking vocabulary. But no one ever says that it's thinking. Of course, planning an essay, for example, it does involve lots of thinking. But no one ever talks about thinking as a separate activity. And... I think that, you know, I, I think that our brains appreciate it when we give them a break and, you know, make the thinking process a bit more conscious. So it is okay to just, um, to just think and it is important to realize what kind of activities, um, what kind of thinking processes happen when we ask our students to do different things in the classroom, especially in terms of uh, when it comes to critical thinking skills, those sub skills. So when we think about thinking, um, there is this, you know, thinking skills can be characterized on a continuum of levels, um, lower levels um, like remembering or repeating information, uh, memorizing, identifying things. So these will be simpler thinking skills. 
Um, and then moving, you know, moving further with applying what we know, with analyzing what we read, evaluating something in the abstract, and finally creating new connections. So that's this originality um, aspect that I talked about before. Um, I believe that knowing how much mental effort those different levels, um, those different well activities which involve those types of thinking, how much mental effort um, they involve, this can also help us plan our classes better. Um, someone is asking, can you do anything without thinking? <laughs> um maybe yes of course you can lots of things this is how we make mistakes <laughs> in life um i'm sure you can yeah you know every single activity of course it is um you, you do it together with with thinking but what i want to do now is to kind of separate um critical thinking and especially at higher level um from uh, you know to treat it as a separate activity, therefore, perhaps allow a bit more time for a more complex activity. If you're looking at the slide and thinking, oh, that looks familiar. Um, yes, yes, it does look familiar. Um, it is the revised Bloom's taxonomy. I'm not going to, well, talk about it in detail right now. But um, what I, I, I actually I want to point out two things related to um, uh, to the taxonomy and you know the way we talk about um, higher order thinking skills and lower order thinking skills. The the first thing is that um, actually it depends on the source I think because when I was doing my research I. I found some differences where exactly higher order thinking skills begin. Is it applying or is it analyzing? Somewhere around, um, somewhere around there. Um, now, there are actually there are two issues that um, that I want to discuss. The first issue is that when we when we talk about critical thinking. Um, very often we mean only higher order thinking skills. Um, but critical thinking, you know, understanding or identifying um, information, this is also thinking. So, so one thing is that um, one thing is that those simpler activities, are also examples of thinking. So they should be focused on as well, not only higher order thinking skills. Um, another, you know, obviously we do want our students to develop as much as possible um, in higher order thinking skills. That's not what I'm, you know, saying. I just want to make a point that lower order thinking skills are still thinking skills. And they should be there in the classroom as well. So that's one point. And another point is in when you think about um, teaching English, for example, um, higher order thinking skills are quite often um, they are quite often expressed through rather complex content and language. And explicitly teaching critical thinking is delayed until higher levels of proficiency. So we've got two issues here, yeah, only focusing on high order thinking skills and um, and waiting until our students reach a certain language level. So what I want to show you is that Pathways, um, National Geographic Learning course, that actually it deals with both those issues. Analyzing, applying, evaluating, inferring, um, these are examples of some critical thinking skills um, practiced in the book, developed in the, um, in the book. Um, and when you look at the list, well, inferring meaning, so reading between the lines, um, this is actually related to understanding, to identifying. So you could say that if we wanted to, 
to categorize those um, those critical thinking skills, that would probably belong to a lower level, um, lower, sorry, lower thinking skill. Um, so we've got a nice mix between higher and, um, and lower um, order thinking skills, of course, with the focus on HOTS, so high order thinking skills. And another, um, another issue that is stressed in the book is that um, critical thinking skills are taught from lower levels of proficiency. So this example, what you see on the screen, this is listening, speaking and critical thinking. Um, level one, which is CFR A to B1 level. So that's a great thing that you can introduce um, elements of those quite early. And um, another thing is that those critical thinking skills are very clearly labeled for you in the book. So you don't need to think about, okay, so what are my students doing right now? It's, it's done for you. I've been focusing on, on the students, well, on the students in general um, so far, but I'd like to take a moment to focus on us, on teachers and critical thinking. As teachers, we, we make hundreds of smaller and bigger decisions every day when it comes to teaching a language. So we think about which language skills are being developed right now, how to integrate one with another, um, what's the best sequence of activities um, that will help achieve those learning outcomes? What's the best timing? How much time should I give um, my students to do a certain task? And uh, so that's done with language skills. But what about thinking skills? We also, you know, <laughs> When we make those decisions, uh, we also ex exercise our critical thinking skills, but being more aware of critical thinking sub skills and being able to name them may help us plan better lessons and allow our students perhaps more time when they really need it, when the task is more complex. So that's something to be taken into consideration by teachers as well. Knowing how to name those skills, um, knowing ways in which those skills are developed will also make the process of assessment much clearer. Because, you know, this is one of the questions really. Um, how do I assess my students' critical thinking skills? So explicitly naming them is one of the one of the things that we can do in order to you know help develop um, their skills. I'm all about making it open, um, involving our students in the learning process, telling them what exactly they're learning, because this is not a mystery. This is, you know, being at school, being at university, this is the time when they learn critical thinking skills as well. Um, when later on they apply for jobs and yes, critical thinking is one of the top skills of the 21st century. Um, big corporations, you know, um, when, when, you, when you read job advertisements, actually, having excellent critical thinking skills is one of the requirements. So students need to understand what those skills are and what they involve if later on in life they apply for their dream job and during the job interview there's this question, you know, a behavioral question. Um, tell me about a situation in which you demonstrated, you know, great critical thinking skills, maybe there will be a question about a certain sub skill. So being at school, being at university, this is the time when they should learn about critical thinking as well. 
Um, so yeah, so Pathways gives you um, Pathways. You know, when you look at the title, actually, it's Pathways is reading, writing, and critical thinking. Critical thinking is considered, you know, as, at the same level really as language skills and learning how to analyze, evaluate evidence, how to justify opinions, brainstorm and so on. Um, so this is treated equally, it's equally important as developing language skills. Yeah? So it's not a simple um, language course. I'm, I'm going to show you um, I'm going to show you a few examples um, from Pathways, but in order to do that, I actually need to tell you a little bit more about how the book works um, and what you can what you can expect. So here you can see some examples of um, critical thinking sub skills. Mm, there are two paths of the course book. Um, reading, writing and critical thinking. So in, in this um, path, I think that's the word, <laughs> in this path, um, there's more focus on, um, on reading and writing, of course. Just want to say that writing is really nicely done. Um, it considers all those different stages of writing. So writing is rewriting. So the focus, um, the focus is that together with critical thinking. Um, in the listening and speaking and critical thinking path, by the way, is anyone counting how many times I've said critical thinking tonight? <laughs> um, in this path, um, there, there are great presentation tasks, um, individual, um, collaborative, great, great, great preparation. And um, in terms of critical thinking, one, one book, so for one level, there are about 150 activities just on critical thinking. I, I don't think I've seen, you know, books like that. It's with, no, I, I, I really like it. I teach from Pathways as well. Um, right. So anyway, I, I want to tell you a little bit more about how those books um, work. So each unit um, has three or two, usually three, um, sources of information, let's say, three different, um, three different types of input. Um, and all those three sources are on the same topic. Um, but what's great, usually different perspectives are presented. So you don't like what I okay, what I sometimes do when we talk about a topic without pathways, when we talk about a certain um, issue topic, you know, it's usually one text in the course book or you find a, an interesting article, um, but it's only one perspective. And that's actually related to what you said at the beginning of the webinar when I asked you about um, critical thinking skills, um, description of critical thinkers, and so having different perspectives, um, considering different perspectives. So that's what is done in Pathways. So this is also a great way to help students build their opinions, build their positions which are supported by evidence that they have, well, heard or read in those three different um, sources of information. So their opinions, you know, we, we're feeding them possible um, arguments, we're feeding them arguments that they can evaluate and then form or formulate their own opinions based on that. So each unit will have three different sources. Um, this is an example from, uh, from listening, speaking and critical thinking level three. Um, this is a unit on the science of shopping. So in this listening lesson, um, students listen to a lecture about differences in the shopping habits of men and women. And of course, you know, there are activities to that help develop listening skills. But um, at the end of the unit, or at the end of the lesson, 
we've got activities clearly labeled um, critical thinking activities. So when we think about reflecting, reflecting on own experience, um, reflecting on own experience in connection or in relation to what they heard in the lecture. So this is formulating an opinion um, and making connections. So we were working on being more original. When it comes to synthesizing, um, synthesizing is gathering information from different sources. It's also evaluating um, information um, from different sources. Uh, one of the most important skills in writing, being able to synthesize and evaluate information. Um, so this is a really nice task that helps students synthesize and question what they heard in this case, because that's um, a that's a task from the listening, uh, speaking and critical thinking path. So that's how critical thinking skills are named in the book. But that's not the end. Creating more independent students is also um, being able to, to help them in becoming better learners by teaching them, again, openly, explicitly about study skills. Whenever I ask my students about their note-taking skills, they all claim, yeah, they're good. They have great um, note-taking skills. Well, but when I ask them about, okay, so how many different systems of taking skills, I'm um, sorry, of taking notes do you know? Um, they don't know. They, they, you know, I think there is a big assumption um, that students somehow just learn how to study. Sorry. Um, but this is a skill. This is a skill that can be worked on. So when we think about study skills, um, note taking, why is it so important in the academic world? Well, first of all, it's the first step towards avoiding plagiarism in writing. Knowing how to take good notes means a lot of things. It's, it's, you know, it is perhaps choosing the best system that will work for you, but also the system of taking notes will depend on the content of the lecture or of the text. It is also rewriting, it's editing notes, um, it's you know constant questioning what you're reading or what you're listening to. And all those skills are also developed in pathways and they are named. So Apart from useful information telling us about different systems, for example, T-chart, mind map, concept map, um, a Venn diagram, um, there are activities which help develop those skills. And again, they're clearly labeled so students know what they're doing. Before we, well, we don't have that much time before we finish today, a few more things to say. Okay, I'll try to be quick. So the power of questions. Um, I am also I'm also a, um, a certified coach, and I must tell you that learning to use the right questions is not that easy at the beginning. Thinking about which questions you should ask to get, you know, to help the person get a better insight to make the person think more about well, their lives, jobs, and so on. Um, this is a skill as well. So I want to tell you a few things about, um, about the questioning approach and about choosing the right questions to ask our learners, because asking questions is one of the best ways um, to create more independent, critical thinkers. When I was, again, when I was doing some research in preparation for this webinar, I came across Brian Oshiro um, and his TED Talk, which I recommend as well. You can see the title on the slide, Encourage Critical Thinking with Three Questions. Um, Brian is a teacher and education consultant, and in his TED Talk, 
he, he explains um, in a very clear way um, what higher order questions are um, and that they're, you know, that they are the key um, to stimulating critical thinking. Um, okay, sorry, I'm just looking at the chat. Sorry, sorry, I got distracted by the chat. Um, anyway, um, what I wanted to what I wanted to tell you um, is, you know, how the type of questions that we ask can determine how much thinking is done um, by our by our students. So higher order thinking, uh, higher order questions. Um, they just like in coaching in coaching we talk about powerful questions um in teaching we talk about higher order questions so they answering them requires much more effort and much more thinking so when you look at these questions from the when you read them from the bottom you don't need to answer in the chat just think about the answers do you know what critical thinking is what are some examples of critical thinking skills why is critical thinking considered to be one of top 21st century skills? To what extent are your students independent critical thinkers? How can you help your students develop thinking skills? You might notice that the higher up we go, the you know answering those questions actually does require different levels of of thinking um, and this is what well not only brian shiro um, but many educators including me encourage you to do with your students to ask questions which will make your students think at higher levels higher order questions higher order thinking skills so one thing can be, you know, one thing, one way of using those questions um, is, of course, about different topics, um, uh, different issues, problems, ideas um, that come up in the classroom and not only. But another thing is um, using those questions to help students with developing their study skills. Now, what you see on the screen, um, well, this is, you know, this is a kind of a simplified version. Um, and of course, I am not saying that um, questions beginning with how are only yeah, at the top of um, higher order thinking skills. We can ask a question like, how do you say, powtarzać bez zastanowienia in English? And that would be related to remembering. But this, um, this slide is just to give you some examples. Um, I do encourage you to, to read more about higher order questions and lower order questions. Very, very interesting topic. Anyway, so how to use those questions to develop um, study skills. Consider the difference between asking your students, um, do you take effective notes? And why is taking good notes important during lectures? And how can you improve your note-taking skills? Give me three examples. And so using higher order questions to get a better insight, to raise awareness of the process of learning is important too. And finally, I'll show you how it can be all put together in a really engaging and um, enjoyable lesson about photographs, National Geographic photographs. So there is, um, there is a very, very interesting text um, about what makes a photograph beautiful. If we had more time, I would probably ask you about your ideas, but you can, you can actually, you can read the text um, because you can download a sample unit um, of actually each of the levels. Um, Adrian, I believe, or Natalia will, We'll send a link in the chat where you can download um, sample units 
or maybe they have already done it. Um, if not, if I could ask you to send a link um, to the website where everybody can download. Okay, great, Natalia, thank you. So, um, so we've got this lesson on beautiful photos and what makes photos beautiful. Um, actually, photography is one of my hobbies, so I was happy to read the whole text. Anyway, um, the lesson helps students develop their reading skills. Yes, um, there's work on vocabulary. Yes, but apart from that, um, we've got a really lovely combination of um, developing study skills. So using a concept map to take notes from the reading. Here, the reveal moment, elements of a beautiful photograph, light, composition, moment, wonder, time, and plot. If you want to re um, find out more, read the text. So students, um, you know, they take notes, they develop these study skills, and, um, and later on, there are some photographs to evaluate. But it's much, much more than saying whether you like the photo or not. Um, it is actually applying ideas. It's applying the criteria, clear criteria to evaluate um, photographs. I would definitely take it to the next level and I would organize a photo competition with my students where I would ask them to you know, experiment with their smartphones, take photos which um, take photos which um, which follow those particular elements, which have those particular elements of beautiful photographs, then upload them, you know, have a comment section. And again, we've got originality, we've got positions, we've got opinions, and those opinions are based on clear criteria. So that's an example of how it could be done. Um, as a recap from our webinar today, I'm just going to ask you to, you know, to think about um, how you would finish the sentence. It is the same statement. Um, think about the three elements, about opinion or position, um, evaluation, questioning, and, and originality. So that's all from me. Um, if you want to learn more, if you want to um, learn more about the book, if you are in Poland, I guess, um, Adrian is your person. <laughs> so these are contact details um, for um, to Adrian. And well, we don't really have time left for questions but um if you have any questions i'll be very happy to um to contact you or actually you can contact me i'll write my email in the chat if anyone um is interested i'll be happy to discuss more about yeah, that's EAP Academy PL. I'll be happy to talk more about critical thinking um, and academic skills, academic writing um, and coaching. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. It's been a great webinar. Uh, thanks a lot, Marta. A lot of ideas, a lot of resources, but a lot of um, food for thought. So, um, well, uh, it's a critical thinking webinar uh, indeed. I must tell you guys that um, if you uh, analyze all the webinars of IOT for Poland, critical thinking, apart from uh, psychology and well being, is the most uh, often spoken of um, topic uh, since the interest is so, so great. And I, I believe that uh, the times that we've got now, that the uh, Time of pandemic, of political changes, of environmental changes, uh, force us to um, simply get better at uh, critical thinking. Uh, Marta, um, once again, thank you very much for uh, for you being here. My and pleasure. Thank you. Thanks a lot. National Geographic Learning. Thanks a lot to Adrian and uh, to Natalia uh, for for making it possible that uh, Marta is uh, with us. Guys, I would like to 
Um, so take your two minutes just right now, because I would like to uh, take you uh, once uh, again uh, to Eitafel, um Poland. And um, I would I I for Poland because um, I would love to um, make sure that you go to I for Poland uh, Facebook and you enroll for the next uh, great uh, webinar. Okay, uh, the next great webinar will be on pronunciation and will be delivered uh, by Sylvie Dolakova, uh, and it will be in a week's time. Okay. So thank you very much. Uh, um, the um, certificates will be sent to you. However, uh, please um, make sure that uh, you also take a look once again at the uh, webinar to take notes of great uh, resources. Okay, thank you very much.